Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. For in the words of Jesus Christ, as he prayed for us, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. It has been estimated that approximately one third of the Holy Bible is prophecy. And that's probably a reasonable statement, a reasonable estimate, uh, although I would really that prophecy is one of the three major divisions or purposes of the Holy Bible, the other two being history, knowing where we are and how we got here, uh, based upon uh, what has happened. Uh, the world did not just begin. It came along a journey, a series of events that the Bible helps us to understand and know about and be aware of, and the other being uh, how to live according to God's way, and that has not changed right from the very beginning. The laws of God are eternal. But prophecy is a major part of the Holy Bible because so much of it has not yet happened yet, and much of what is described in prophecy may very well be something that we will be experiencing uh, depending upon when the, the, the return of Christ happens. Uh, no one knows when that's going to be, although, uh, as we mentioned a couple times in other sermons, there is one, one major clue or fact, if you want to call it that, because it is factual, in knowing that when Christ's return will be exactly three and one-half years away, and that is the, re the beginning of of the ministry of the two witnesses. Their ministry will be 42 months long. It will be powerful uh, right from day one. So there will be no mistaking that their ministry has begun. Uh, contrary to, to a number of people I hear from uh, who claim to be the two witnesses, I've heard from so many of them now, uh, it's, it's, just, it's just something, it's become normal, even though they are not normal people. And I'm not being, uh, I'm not, somehow being unkind to them when I say that, but most of the people, or all of the people who write and claim that, make that claim, are just not right in all definitions of that word. And they, the two witnesses, however, the genuine two witnesses, when their ministry begins, and it will be miraculous throughout the time of their ministry, of the 42-month ministry, you'll know when day one of their ministry begins that the return of Jesus Christ will be 42 months away because they will be martyred at the end of their 42 month ministry and the return of Christ will happen not long after that so when they appear on the scene you know you will know that they are we are close and there are other other references in the Bible to how it may happen tonight and so on but that is simply re referring to if we died if you die today the return of Christ to you, if you are one of God's true people, means it's going to happen instantly from your perspective because you don't sense the passage of time. Uh, the same as Peter and Paul and all the apostles. Uh, for them, it has happened because even though it hasn't, they're all in their graves 
sleeping, dead. Uh, the dead are dead. That's what dead means. Dead means dead. But from their perspective, from the moment that they died or were killed, most of them were martyred, uh, they will instantly be there at the re first resurrection, the return of Jesus Christ. So from their perspective, and that's how verses use that terminology or, or that way of stating it and how people have misunderstood it uh, in terms of thinking that they go to heaven or they're in, in heaven now or alive in heaven and so on, when in fact they're not, they're dead. But the major... The one major clue that the Bible does give us is that when the two witnesses appear on the scene, and we'll discuss them, that the return of Jesus Christ will be three and a half years away, 42 months. And so, and they obviously are not here yet. There are a lot of people who think they are the two witnesses who are out there, who think they are the two witnesses. Uh, and I've heard from many, many of them now. And my only question to them is, you know, don't tell me, show me. If you're one of the two witnesses, show me a miracle. Don't just tell me that you're one of the two witnesses and, and you know, what am I supposed to do about it? Uh, and again, the the two witnesses, I really cannot imagine anyone in their right mind wanting to be one of the two witnesses. Not not, And by that, I don't mean that the two witnesses aren't going to be in their right minds. They most certainly are. But they're going to be given a horrendous job to do. And no one would want that, to do that. Uh, no matter how much we want to serve God, it's not something that anyone in their right mind would volunteer for because it's just going to be a horrible thing that they're going to have to, to go through, to do, even though they will be serving God and they will be doing everything they're doing according to God's will and according to God's instructions, but they will be forced to defend themselves with lethal force. Uh, how many people can handle that? Uh, and still not lose any sleep over it because they're going to have to remain healthy and strong through their time of ministry in 42 months. And they're going to have miraculous power. And the time in which they will be active will be a time that will be very, very tumultuous upon this earth uh, as described in prophecy very plainly. There are a number of people or groups of people or types of people who are described in prophecy very plainly and that is the purpose of our sermon today and the true people of God true Christians of God although they will recognize the two witnesses it will be hard to miss them the rest of the world isn't which is bizarre in itself because of the miracles that they will be performing uh, and I don't think they're going to just enter upon the scene uh, calling down fire from heaven upon uh, people uh, who are trying to kill them. I think it's going to take a while for people to want to kill them. I mean, the logic of that, because the two witnesses will be given power to defend themselves. They're not going to be uh, taking human life uh, just wantonly or illegally. They're going to be forced to defend their very own lives by the command of God in how they're going to do it. And it's going to take a while for people to hate them enough to want to kill them. They're going to, to reject them just as the world has rejected Christ and killed him at the same thing because they're actually going to be preaching that same truth just as God's people always have. But in terms of the, of the time factor, the two witnesses are the key to understanding when Christ's return will happen. We know it's 42 months from the day one of their ministry. But the rest of the church, the true people of God, although they will recognize the two witnesses and will rejoice, certainly have reason for rejoicing when they appear upon the scene, uh, at that very same, same time they will also, the people of God, the saints, as we will discuss what that term actually means, are going to be facing, most of them, terrible persecution and martyrdom, some of them, some of us, and that is going to be a very hard time because they too will be preaching. Eventually that's all going to be stopped. Uh, the world is not going to put up with the truth. It's going to try to stop it. And that's where the two witnesses come in. But in terms of the people of end time prophecy, the two witnesses, uh, the saints, the elect church on the good side and on the bad side, the very famous Antichrist, uh, which is something that has actually existed through time. It's not... It will have an ultimate end time fulfillment, 
but the Antichrist, the spirit of Antichrist, and the many Antichrists and the false Christs have, have existed through time, as we'll have a, a look at today. But many of the things of prophecy that, that we've been so familiar with, suddenly they're going to be happening. Uh, sooner or later to somebody. If not us, then a generation later on. I don't think we have that long. And also the nations of Europe will rise up again. Uh, we're going to look at the beast power uh, today, what the Bible actually says about it, the papacy's role in that beast power. Uh, many people today uh, look at the United States of America as the beast power. Even I hear from many Americans who actually suspect that the United States of America is the beast power. It's not. It can't be. It's part of it in terms of the deceived people. But the United States of America does not fit Rome. Rome is Rome, and the United States of America has only existed for about 300 some years, whereas the Roman Empire has existed for over 2,000 years and has many revivals, and the papacy has always been an integral part of that Roman Empire, just as it will be at the end. And the United States of America uh, could never, will never allow the papacy to rule it in the way that the papacy already rules Europe. Uh, things like the separa separation of church and state is not a part of many of the European nations' constitutions. They are already... Uh, Roman Catholicism is the official language, or the official... Uh, you might as well say language, too, because it's how people think in terms of what they say and what they speak about it. But it's the official religion of many nations of Europe. And despite the last few years, the... The, the effect, the military activities of the United States around the world. It's a shadow of it, certainly. Uh, the beast power will be doing the very same thing. But the beast power, uh, if you look at how this, the, the problems that the U.S. military has encountered around the world, despite the, the massive power of the U.S. military, look what's happening. You can see that, that great military power alone is not enough to accomplish what's being described, what's described in Revelation 13, that great world power that's going to have so much control over all nations because it's the deception. It's they're, they're going to own the hearts and minds through that deception, through the Pope's false miracles. People are going to be, and it will be happening in the United States as well, Many, and not just Catholics, but Protestants as well. But as a national entity, the United States of America does not fit that end-time beast power. It has always been Rome throughout history, and we will see how many revivals of that. Hitler, for example, was a, was a, a, a weaker, weaker possible end-time revival of it. Uh, some people of the church back at that time thought it could have been Hitler, and it could have been because he certainly had that the evilness about him. He did not have the papacy's blessing. Uh, pretty much through the reign of Adolf Hitler, uh, the Pope hid in the Vatican. He was deathly afraid of Adolf Hitler because Hitler would have would have uh, taken him out if he would have give, given Hitler, Hitler any trouble. Hitler had no fear of the papacy. And I don't think the end time beast power military leader will either considering the fact that it, the Pope will be the one performing the miracles for that great military leader. But in terms of, of the two of them being anywhere but in Europe, it just doesn't fit. They've always been in Europe. And part of also a recent study that we we talked about, Anglo-Israelism, who they are in terms of national entities, they're spread throughout the world, but they are also not national entities, just the same as the people of Judah are. But it's Europe. It's got to be. And we can prove that from the Bible, how only and only Europe can fit. Uh, the United States uh, has that power, military power, or military power alone just isn't enough if you don't have the hearts and minds. And religion is where you get that from. Uh, political power doesn't work, doesn't travel well nation to nation. Uh, one, one nation's choice of a political system might do very, very well for that nation. But when it's transferred to another people, another culture, another nation, it doesn't fit. It, it doesn't take into consideration the cultural and historical reality of that people, of that society. And it just doesn't fit. Uh, democracy, for example, works fine here, 
here in Canada and the United States and in Britain, democracy works very, very well, but there are other nations in which people reject democracy because they regard it as a form of anarchy. A king is coming, and that king is Jesus Christ. He's going to be an absolute ruler because world, the events that are leading up to his return are going to prove that man is incapable. Man's systems of government, no matter how good they are, uh, certainly democracy here in the Western world, I think, is the best political system for the Western world. It doesn't work on other, in other places in the world because it does not take into consideration the cultural and historic realities of, of a particular people, a particular culture, apart from this. But just today, a look at some of the players, the cast of end-time prophecy, because actually you are, uh, if we're within striking range of that time then you are mentioned there, described there and how some of the people who misunderstand prophecy in terms of the place uh, if you ignore the historical reality how we got to where we got to be and again that's another point of the reason for a third of the Bible being history to understand how we got to where we are and how there is a limit to how far we can go, how far the world can go, uh, without the world destroying itself. Uh, because it's it's doing it, really, if not by weapons, but by things how humans are actually now affecting the climate of Earth. Global warming is now attributed, much of it, to humanity. Things that we are doing as, as a life form are actually destroying the very planet that we depend on for life. And it's that in itself, alone, apart from nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction, um, prove that humanity can't go on. But look today at the cast of end-time prophecy. And we will begin with the saints, a word which is very much misunderstood by at least one major church organization. I remember growing up as a as a Roman Catholic, ch- saints were uh, dead people up in heaven that we used to pray to uh, to uh, help us uh, because they were in heaven and, and uh, we were to pray to them, the intervention of the saints, the intercession of the saints, or else they were uh, a little stone or plaster statues uh, that we would look to as so their saint uh, such and such uh, person. I remember uh, one of the nuns uh, it's. I went to a Catholic school for four years, and uh, the the class was just full of uh, good Catholic names. Um, not not meaning that only those names are Catholic, but names that you would, uh, the Anthony's and Michaels and you know Marys I and mean, a lot of those and and so on. And I remember uh, one of the nun. I used to ask her uh, one particular nun. I remember her. Uh, she. I used to ask her questions. Uh, I, I mean, I, I wasn't trying to be anything contrary or anything, but I asked her questions that I remember she couldn't answer. Uh, and she just used to get a little uh, upset with me sometimes. And I wasn't trying to be, you know, disrespectful or anything. But she just, she, there were times when I, I was just, I just wanted the answers. I just asked him questions. And, and she just couldn't seem, to, I, whether she was angry at me or angry at herself, at her own lack of understanding, and I think that may actually have been it more than anything. And she, I remember this one day, she was going down, she was one of those days she was a little bit perturbed at me, I guess, and she was just going down the, we were talking about Catholic saints, and this was a long time ago, but I can still remember it, and she was going down the, the rows of all the students of, you know, the St. Mary and St. Michael and all these Catholic names, and she got to me and she says, I don't think there is a St. Wayne. And she looked at me as if, because I, I'd been rather uh, asking her questions that day, she didn't have the answer, but she just sort of, she said it, she wasn't being mean or anything, she was just saying as if saints aren't, aren't supposed to ask questions, I guess. And But according to the Bible definition, it isn't people, dead people up in heaven. First of all, the dead aren't in heaven, they aren't anywhere, but in their graves. And it isn't some pope or some other human that decides what a saint is. God decides who the saints are. 
and that is the people who obey God. They are the saints. They are set apart. Saint means sanctified or set apart. To They've come out of the world, this evil world, this godless world, and lived according, and are living according to God's way. That's what a saint is. It's set apart. It's bringing out of the world. And that is the Bible def- definition. That's all it means. And they are just as human as the people who aren't saints. And they live their lives, then they die. And they're awaiting the resurrection. The saints will be the first resurrection at the return of Jesus Christ. But they're dead. Saints are dead. You don't pray. People, millions of Catholics, pray to the saints. And those prayers aren't heard. There's only one you should pray to, and that's to God. First of all, even if the saints were alive, you shouldn't be praying to them. You should be praying to God. But praying to a, to, to a dead person, what good is that? What possible good is that? Although, of course, they don't recognize the fact that, that saints are dead, but they are. Now, here's an example. Uh, when Christ died, uh, there was a great earthquake, and some of the saints who were dead, and dead means dead, they were temporarily resurrected to physical life as part of the miracle of that day, as a witness of that day. Matthew 27, 51-53, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So you see, they were dead. Notice the words, they slept and they arose. So they were dead. And it plainly calls them saints, the people of God at the time. The dead are dead. Saints are dead. And they're alive when they're alive. And then when they die, they're, they're awaiting the resurrection. And yet millions of people pray to the saints uh, or, or look to saints to protect them. And in fact, you know, dead people are pretty helpless. They can't do much until their resurrection. Uh, but saint simply means sanctified, set apart. And you're a saint. If you obey what's in this book, then you're a saint. If you truly obey it, you're set apart. You've come out of the world. You're going to be in that first resurrection. Also known, the saints are also known as the elect. Uh, we won't get into that at the moment because we have to kind of move along here to get everybody or some the major people the major cast of end time prophecy but saints are people if you obey what's in this book you're a saint and I know that may may make some people feel uncomfortable but the fact is in the Bible the saints were real people they were real people they weren't godly in terms of godlike as the way many people regard them the perception of saints they were ordinary people just like you or me or anybody else who were living according to what's in the word of God that's what made them saints and here's another example just to show how the definition the biblical definition the true definition of saint means the people of God the church of God 1 Corinthians 1 2 unto the church of God which which is at Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord both theirs and ours so you see the humanity of what it's describing there and what the Bible has to say about saints is not God like people they were humans and they lived their lives and they died and they're awaiting that first resurrection the saints will be in the first resurrection at the day of Christ's return and the world coming out of the world part of what makes them be being a saint is what makes the world hate them uh, it makes you seem strange if you don't go along with the ways of the world instead live according to God's way uh, most of the time it's just a matter of, of being thought of as odd but it's going to come to the point where eventually persecution is going to happen again I mean, it's, it's throughout history some of the things that were done to the true people of God, the martyrdom, not just killing them, but in the manner in which they were killed, the torture, burned alive, skinned alive, cut in two alive, just how a human, any human could do that to another human being is just unimaginable to anyone who, who is not totally wicked, 
to even think of, of wanting to do that to another human being. And yet, throughout history, that has happened to God's true people. Many, many, many of them were martyred. And martyr, the actual word martyr, is from a Greek word which simply means witness. It's their being witnesses of the truth, preachers of the truth, that turn them into martyrs. That word is actually means the same thing. Uh, the Greek word which means witness is pronounced similar to martyr and that's how the witness became a martyr but they were killed and there's more to come who are going to be killed the true people of God uh, Revelation 13.7 speaking of the beast and the false prophet the Pope and that European beast power that great warlord and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and war there does not mean that they will be like armed uh, people, uh, but war in the sense that they will be killed, and it, just to go after them and and kill them. And the saints of God are not uh, troopers; they're not military. There's nothing, anything like that in terms of what uh, they will, how they behave. They're simply people of God, peaceful people of God who preach the truth. God's people were never warriors in that sense. Even the two witnesses are not going to be warriors. They will be preachers, but they will be given a job to do and God will provide them with the means to protect themselves in order for them to get their job done, the God, godly job, the God-given job that they've been given to do. Otherwise, they'd be dead. They wouldn't be alive for three and a half years. They're going to be forced to defend themselves. And the description of the two witnesses, who will be two saints, will be... As I said earlier, uh, people write to me and they claim to be the two witnesses, and I don't see anyone who would want a job like that, to volunteer themselves for such a job as that. I mean, we all want to serve God, that's true, but those two people are going to have a horrendous 42 months. All the church, actually, is going to have a 42 month, uh, a horrendous 42 months because they're all going to be persecuted and these two people are going to have miraculous means to protect themselves until the end they're going to be martyred too as we'll get to we'll read of them here but they are not going to be people who are somehow looking to be heroes or looking to be stars or looking to be some sort of wonderful people in terms of, of oh look at me I'm one of the two witnesses kind of thing and that's the, that's sort of the attitude that people write to me about I mean what do they want me to do they write to me and say they're one of the two witnesses what am I supposed to do about it and my question if I was to ask them one is you know don't don't tell me show me if you're one of the two witnesses show me show the world because I, I would certainly welcome welcome their arrival because that would be you know the return of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God would mean 42 months away it's going to be a whole lot better world. I mean, the world is not all that bad right now. It's tolerable on a physical physical way. I mean, we all have our problems and things that we have to to put up with every day. One of the things I, I've noticed about being having to deal with many... I, I meet so many, so many nice people. Uh, or meet, well, actually by email, but so many, many nice people from all around the world and yet, at the same time, there's a lot of very nasty people uh, who write, and you're open to that now. And one of the ironies is, uh, I've found too, is that in order to be a true, truly Christian and to respond to them in a truly Christian way, you have to become more thick-skinned, to use a modern-day term, uh, in order to be thin-skinned. Because there are a lot of very nasty people out there who claim to be Christian and if you preach what's in this book you're going to make them very mad and some of them would go beyond just mad if they had the chance I'm sure of that and Bible prophecy certainly makes that plain and certainly history makes that plain as well how people have been how Christians people claiming to be Christian have actually martyred other Christians killed other Christians and I can see that happening uh, how it could happen in the attitude of some people who write. Uh, we've never had any kind of problem with that, but in terms of what is described, in terms of the persecution of the saints, as we just read there, uh, the, the beast power will make war with the saints and overcome them. 
and what's going to be done to the two witnesses eventually after they're martyred and how they're going to be forced to defend themselves you can see and again all real people they're not up in heaven uh, where we have to look at little plaster statues of them here down on earth you're going to see the real people real people on earth and they're going to be preaching the truth the very same truth that's always been preached but they're going to be preaching it on a, on a worldwide scale such as never has been done and they're going to be forced to defend themselves and in a way that will be miraculous because otherwise they would not be able to survive as long the world's not going to put up with their truth that they preach consider what the Bible actually says about these two saints these two people that are called the two witnesses Revelation 11, 3-12 and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies and if any man will hurt them he must in this manner be killed these have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will and when they have finished their testimony the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also our Lord was crucified and they of the earth and all kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and in half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves and they that dwell upon the earth shall dwell shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth and after three days and in half the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them come up hither and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud and their enemies beheld them and as I mentioned before their ministry their 42 month ministry is the only time clue that we are given in the word of God when we can expect the return of Jesus Christ when their ministry begins begins on the day the day that their ministry begins Jesus Christ's return will be 42 months away three and a half years away from that time and it's a plain as day prophecy it plainly describes it but you can see that they too will be two people real people and I've heard so many fanciful ideas about what the two witnesses are some say it's the Old and New Testament some say it's it's just various things two angels uh, angels can't be killed uh, um, the Old and New Testament can't be killed you can't kill a book you can't kill something that isn't lifeless and you can't kill a, an angel these two people humans will be killed they will be martyred their dead bodies will lie out in the streets uh, the enemies of God won't even give them a burial and over those three and a half days the bodies will likely be abused uh, so they're going to be a horrendous sight in that way in what's going to be done to them they will be resurrected and they will be brought to life That at that day they will be spirit beings they will not have to be worrying about what was done damage that was done to their bodies anymore after that they will ascend to heaven they won't stay there long they're coming right back because Christ is coming down and the return of Jesus Christ will mark the first resurrection of the saints now we've covered that in other sermons but you can see real people real people people up in heaven uh, aren't killed and left to lie in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days are they and they're not on earth preaching things and they're not on earth doing things that these two people are plainly described as doing as as doing as they're going to do and forced to defend themselves in a world that that hates the truth simply hates it but it's going to learn to love the truth after Christ's return but that's beside the point but that is essentially the good people of the side and bad people much of the world is going to be in the bad people class vacation even though many of them will be good people at heart they will believe 
that they're doing the right thing. As Christ said, there's coming a time when, when they will kill you thinking they're doing God a service. So it won't be a matter of, of evil-minded people, but they will be doing evil. Deceived people will be doing evil because of the deceptions of those false miracles of the Pope primarily. People are going to believe that they're, they have a choice between their salvation and just surrendering to whatever the Pope says. The, the Protestant Reformation will simply cease to happen, cease to exist, cease to have an effect because the, re, the Roman Catholic Church will simply take them all back. They're all going to run back to Rome doctrinally. They really aren't all that far away now. The difference between the teachings of most Protestant churches and the Roman Catholic Church really aren't very different. Uh, the only real difference that they have is their leadership, who is the head of their church. And of the Church of God, who is our leader? Who is our leader? God is. God is the leader. Church of God means God's church. And Jesus Christ is the head of the Christian church under God. Because ultimately, ultimately, the reason for Christ's coming is to make, to prepare the way for God's coming. You know, we're not going to heaven. God's coming to earth, as we'll get to. But it, it, saints are simply people. You don't pray to them. We don't pray to each other, do we? We pray to God. How silly it is for us to imagine praying to another human being, someone who's just as human as you are who is just as much in need of salvation as you are. We don't pray to each other. We pray to God. And if some of us are dead, then we're even less help to one another because the dead are asleep. They're in their graves awaiting the resurrection. They can't hear you. They can't do anything to help you until they're resurrected. And then, well, then they are going to help the world. But they're not there yet. That's not going to happen until Christ's return. The Antichrist is certainly also a well-known term uh, which many people think of as, as just an end-time individual and it will reach its ultimate fulfillment in an individual or a pair of individuals but as we shall see from the Bible record it's actually much more than that and much more ancient than that. Antichrist is from a Greek word which means opposition to the Messiah. Anti means against. Antichrist is found specifically, using that particular term, it's actually found in other ways, in many other ways, in, in many other descriptions, but using the actual Antichrist word in the original Greek, it's found only five times in the Holy Scriptures. Four times as Antichrist, and once as Antichrists. So you see, there's, it's more than just an individual. It was used only by the Apostle John and only in two of his epistles to the church in which he was writing. Uh, he was not referring to pagans. He was not referring to atheists. He was not referring to people of other religions. As John was writing it, he was not referring to non-Christian or non-Christian professing people in his description of the Antichrist. And that in itself is startling, in a way, because how can Christians be Antichrist? It doesn't seem to make sense, does it? But if you've been uh, a Roman Catholic for a while, you can understand it. Or if you understand the history of Europe, European history, which was actually as much a history of the Roman Catholic Church as, as it was merely a political history, you can understand how that can be. How someone claiming to be Christian can actually martyr Christians. And it has happened throughout history. We've done other other sermons. Uh, I don't remember the, the title of it. Uh, it was something like Printers and Preachers, which described in just people how printers of the Holy Bible in Europe were martyred. They weren't even preachers. They were simply people who wanted to get the Word of God into the hands of ordinary people so they could read the Word of God for themselves and not just be told what it means by someone who wasn't even, even teaching it to them. And that particular group, that organization, that so-called church, 
so much feared the word of God that it was killing people who were printing it little and, and teaching it and living by it they simply couldn't tolerate it so you can understand the principle that John was talking about there and he was talking about people who were at one time Christian and who fell away or who were then claiming to be Christian but who were actually opposing Christianity in the process so does that sound familiar? it sure does doesn't it? we all recognize that in terms of things that have happened not just in the Roman, in the case of the Roman Catholic Church but in, in also in the case of a very large true church of God in the modern day era in which it has happened to them the apostasy that happened there to that organization not to the true church of God because the church is the people and they're, they left most of them there's still some there uh, and as I think I mentioned in, in one other sermon uh, I really wish they'd get out of there because they're in a bad place for themselves not just bad in terms of, of the evil but they're in a bad place because they understand the truth and it must be a very uncomfortable thing for them to go and attend Sabbath do they does the worldwide church of God still observe the Sabbath I don't know or is it both now do they observe Sunday Sunday and the Sabbath you can sort of I'm not I'm not familiar with that uh, I, I've heard from so many people that organization true people of God true church of God and we we also addressed that in an earlier sermon. Uh, that organization, as a true church of God, died. It still exists, but it's not a part of the true church of God anymore. But the people, the true church, the people, they're alive and well. I hear from them all the time, and they're doing just fine. They're scattered all over the place right now. That's that's one thing, but maybe God wanted it that way, or wants it that way because however else we may reason just what happened there and how it was allowed to happen there there is a bottom line reality that nothing can happen if God doesn't want it to or allow it to at the very least allow it to and that scattering has happened and that's a reality I hear from, from people of that organization and of, of the splitter groups which also some of which have, have splintered mainly because of, of leadership struggles and it, the scattering is, is just all over the place and I just can't help but wonder if we are entering into the end time if it isn't a way for God to protect his people or have God's people protected more in that the scattering is just very hard to do to them that might have been easier to do to them if they had remained united in that way because it's amazing to me one of the reasons one of the reasons that daily Bible study continues to grow the way it is is because of those scattered people and many of whom listen to these sermons now every week on the, on the internet or get the CD in, in because they realize the internet uh, someday uh, is not going to be working for the true church of God. You won't have to worry about it though because when when that happens the two witnesses will be there preaching and it will be the same gospel. So you don't have to worry about that but there is something and it will be, believe it or not, a, a so-called Christian organization or Christian people and I'm not talk, talking solely about the Roman Catholic Church because when it when that begins happening, there'll be just as many mainstream so-called Protestants who will be just as much a part of that persecution, just as much a part of that spirit of Antichrist, which means against Christ. Because as I said, as we'll get to in a moment, John, John's references to Antichrist wasn't talking about atheists he wasn't talking about Muslims or or some other group I mean the Muslims are, are certainly in the are viewed as a great threat today but I think that that's just that's not religious is it it's more political than anything in that sense but read 
we will read here what John has to say about the Antichrist. And it, it becomes easier to see and that spirit of Antichrist which has affected so many people without them even realizing it. The spirit of Antichrist is what's holding the Roman Catholic Church together. As shocking as that may seem. Because if they understood the truth, they wouldn't be a part of that organization. The thing would fall apart. It's that lack of knowledge of the truth and of the the Antichrist beliefs that are making that organization hold together. When people begin to understand the truth and see the truth, they're gone. When I understood the truth, I left. Nobody put me out. No one did anything. I left. And I know a lot of others who did as well. I still hear from other Catholics who are still there and they write once in a while to give me a piece of their mind. Uh, call me nasty things and that's all right. Uh, I think they'll one day regret that they did it because I think one day they're going to realize the truth and realize that they're wrong. And that's part of turning the other cheek as well because sometimes your greatest enemy can turn out to be your greatest friend. Look at the Apostle Paul. You want to give an example of Antichrist. How he began, he was persecuting Christians. Not just not just calling them names or sending them emails or letters or whatever. He was actually taking part in their killing of Christians. He took part in the martyrdom of Stephen, a true man of God. Saul stood there and was a part of that murder. And yet after his conversion, Paul became one of the greatest Christians that this world physical world will ever know. He, he is responsible for writing a very, very large part of what we regard today as the New Testament that we look to for the truth. And yet he was a part of the very effort at the beginning to destroy the very movement to teach that truth. And look at the irony of that. So there are people out there today uh, who although they don't understand the truth and may very much oppose it, uh, may one day come around, and I think most of them will, when the time is right. But consider here what John spoke about in his description of the Antichrist. 1 John 2, 18-19 Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So they were false Christians. Or they were people who fell away. Perhaps they did have the truth, some of them, but fell away. So, logically, who is the Antichrist? Well, we have to keep in mind that the spirit of Antichrist is something, it's a spirit of deception, something that opposes Christ, opposes the truth, opposes Christ's people, who teach the truth and live by the truth. 1 John 2, 22-24 Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And sometimes the King James English is a little awkward uh, to the human, to the modern day human mind, the English speaking mind because we're not used to to the way it's also sort of a, often a tongue twister to read it uh, as I've discovered once in a while but it's describing a going out or falling away of Christians it's not talking about uh, Jews attacking uh, Christians or Muslims attacking Christians or Hindus attacking Christians or atheists attacking Christians it's about a falling away of Christians who become anti-Christian or anti-Christ when they do so. And again, the Church of Rome began 
you know, it, the Christians at Rome began true, and some of them were corrupted. And what from that corruption grew with the help of the Roman Empire, the Roman Catholic Church. And that allegiance between the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, and the Emperor of Rome has gone on for practically 2,000 years. And it's not done yet. Revelation 13, as we'll get to in a moment, is actually about those two people. John 2 John 1, 6-8 And this is love that we walk in His commandments. This is the commandment that, as ye have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we not lose those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. So we're talking, he's talking there about corruption. Corrupting the truth. And who can do that? Who do you listen to? You listen to Christian preachers if you're a Christian, don't you? You don't look to the teachings of someone who, who of some other religion. You look to the teachings of Christians. Christian professing people. And they're the ones that can corrupt you. And look at what's happened to the Church of Rome. That began as a part of the true Church of God. Paul actually converted many of those people. And look what happened. Further, in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-14, to speaking of the end time, the ultimate fulfillment. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know that withholdeth that he that might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is in the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they shall believe a lie, that they might all be damned, who believeth not the truth, but hath pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, beloved brethren of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you, again, the, the sanctification is the same word from which we get saint. So you see, the danger isn't from other religions. It's not from the danger is not from the Muslims or unconverted Jews or any other religion or atheists. It's coming from within what calls itself Christianity. And that, that's been proven out, as we said, for the last two thousand years. The martyrdoms that have been happening by people who claim to be Christian upon Christians, true Christians. And that is about to get very much worse before the Christ returns. We know that from numerous prophecies, but Revelation 13, Revelation chapter 13, really sums up very, very well the struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil, the forces of truth and the forces of deception, the forces of Christ versus the forces of Antichrist, that will happen just prior to 
the return of Jesus Christ. And again, uh, as we'll read here, the power that will be given by Satan unto that beast will last for 42 months. Now, where does that number ring a bell? Two witnesses. Those two numbers match. So you'll see, just as when they reach their greatest power, the other side will as well. And that is the reason that God will give them the power that they're going to be giving them. Because Satan is going to be empowering the deception and the political power of that beast. Uh, it's going to be not business as usual. It's not just going to be a natural fight. It's going to be a fight of on a far higher plane or different level in terms of it not just being a physical fight anymore. It never was entirely anyway because Satan has always been influencing, but it, not before ever will it be at that level in which Satan will know or begin to finally accept the reality that his days are numbered and he's going to just completely go berserk uh, out of probably panic more than anything. Uh, he, he's not a wise spirit being, obviously, and he's just irrational and he's going to just completely bring out the devastation at that time, prior to that time. Prior, just prior to the return of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 13 very, very well sums up that force, those opposing forces, uh, what the saints will be up against. Uh, this does not mention the two witnesses, but obviously it does mention that 42 months time uh, and the persecution that will be happening as we described. Uh, the true church of God will recognize those two witnesses but uh, and will rejoice because of that. When, uh, when they appear because they know that Christ's return will be within that 42 month time but their rejoicing uh, will be very much tempered by the persecutions that are going to be horrendous persecutions that they're going to be subjected to as we're about to read here so it isn't going to be an easy last 42 months but at least we will know God's people will know that there is light at the end of that tunnel at 42 months it's a long time. Three and a half years is a long time to, to go through something like that. Um, and maybe the lucky ones will be the ones who, who are martyred, really, because considering what humans are capable of doing to one another uh, in, in terms of religion, uh, a lot of per, there's been a lot of political persecution and political murder, but it really doesn't... You read a little European history, or Europe, history of any nation, but I'm talking about... Christian perspective or Christian profess professing perspective uh, you read a little bit of European history and, and it will just make you sick of what people who claim to be Christian have done to other people who were truly Christian and we will see here it's going to happen more Revelation 13 uh, with a few points of explanation inserted we're running short on time so we'll have to go uh, through this now. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Uh, the Roman Empire, to insert there, took on the name Holy, the Holy Roman Empire, and while persecuting God's true people. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So, as I said, Satan is going to be directly involved in the power of that beast power and the deceptions that will help that beast power become so powerful, those great false miracles. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And to insert, the Roman Empire has suffered two such wounds. Uh, the first was the so-called fall of the Roman Empire, 
uh, in the 5th century. It fell, but it didn't die. It just sort of tripped and fell. It got up. It's been got up and tripped again and fell a few more times throughout history, but it never died. And the other serious wound, of course, was uh, a religious, from a religious perspective, uh, was Luther's Reformation. But it actually uh, is going to be healed as well because, as we said, once the Pope's miracles begin, uh, the Christian, the pro the Protestant Christian professing world, most of them are going to run right back to Rome because their doctrines already really aren't all that different. Uh, from Christmas to Easter to Sunday, uh, Trinity, immortal soul, going to heaven when you die, and all the, the whole list, it's, it's practically identical. And when the Pope's miracles begin, that will be it. Uh, the, that wound caused by Luther and the many other Protestant reformers, and Luther took the credit for a lot of what uh, work of a lot of other people there. I don't, I don't mean I'm taking anything away from him. He was obviously a very brave man, but there were a lot of others involved in that Protestant Reformation. And to continue, and they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? So you notice they worship the dragon, which is Satan. They're worshiping Satan, and Satan, uh, who is going to be empowering that beast and the military power of that beast and by the way also when it says who is able to make war with him uh, you could probably include who is willing to make war with him because the deception is going to be so strong that no one's want, going to want to fight again it comes down to hearts and minds uh, the United States of America today militarily is a superpower it is massive a massive military power and yet look what happens how it can get bogged down in, in places like Iran and Iraq if hearts and minds are not there and what we're describing what we're reading about here in Revelation 13 it isn't just two small countries in the Middle East it's talking about the whole world so you see the effect of hearts and minds those false miracles that are going to make people think that it isn't just a matter of he's going to be able to defeat them militarily but a lot of nations are simply going to surrender that's really what it comes down to because of the Pope's false miracles, which are actually satanic miracles. And through him, they are worshipping Satan. To continue, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. There's those forty-two months, and you know who's going to be opposing them at that time is God's two witnesses, while that great persecution is happening. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So you see why, why I said there that the, the true saints of God, the true people of God, will rejoice that the two witnesses have come along, but they are also going to be enduring horrendous persecution at that time and martyrdom and so on so it's not going to be a time of joy in terms of their daily life they'll have joy in the knowledge that the two witnesses are there and that Christ's return is is the clock is ticking down those 42 months to Christ's return but those 42 months are not going to be easy and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world and if any man have an ear let him hear he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So again, uh, the description of, of what they're going to be going through. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth, and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And that's something the two witnesses will also be doing. And continuing the great false prophet, And he deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them which dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast which was wounded which had the wound by the sword and to live. So you can see also why the two witnesses are going to be hated because at this very same time the Pope's, Pope's great miracles are going to appear uh, to people who who are Catholics and Protestants and 
he's going to be teaching them the doctrines that they've already accepted, whereas the, the two witnesses are going to be Sabbath keepers, they're going to be rejecting Christmas, they're going to be rejecting Easter in favor of Passover, they're going to be observing all the true holy days of God and preaching that so you can see, and you already know if you, if you observe them, that they aren't exactly popular in the so-called Christian world. So you can see how everything is stacked against them. And when the Pope's miracles start, that's why the great miracles and the truth that the two witnesses are going to be preaching are going to be rejected, and why they're going to be hated, and why they're going to be murdered, and why their bodies will be left to just left there out in the streets for three and a half days, likely being abused uh, while they're there. Continuing, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed and he that causeth all both small and great rich and poor free and bond to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark of the beast or the name of the beast or the number of his name and that's actually uh, we've done studies on that I refer you to those uh, we're running short on time I think we mentioned that in other sermons as well. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beasts, for it is the number of man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. And that is, of course, the very infamous 666. 666. So you see how and why it is Satan will be in there empowering the Pope's great false miracles who will be in political alignment with that Roman emperor as just as he's been throughout history it's not going to be anything new it's already easy it's easy to, to recognize what's going to happen if you just read a little history because it's happened numerous times already um, and those mortal wounds serious wounds that have happened to the Roman Empire the fall of the Roman Empire which was as I said, it just sort of slipped and fell. It got back up again, and it fell again a number of times up and down. Hitler, again, uh, was actually a foreshadow of the end time one. Uh, certainly a number of people, true, true people of God who understood prophecy, actually mistook Hitler as being that, that great end time power. Um, and he well could well have been. If it had gone that farther, he could well have been. He certainly... It's an understandable mistake that they made at that time. Uh, if Hitler came along today, we could probably make the same mistake very easily. But you can see how, because of the Pope's miracles, goes false miracles, and he'll already be teaching things, the doctrines, the traditions of men, which call itself Christianity, whereas the true, the two witnesses will be teaching things like the Sabbath and the, and the true biblical holy days and the truth of the Bible which isn't popular, so you see why it is they're going to be persecuted and hated and murdered, and just why the true people of God are going to be the same thing, persecuted and, and hated, and some of them killed. That's why it's going to happen. But the good news is, as we also know, is that the saints are going to win. When Christ returns, it's going to be a victory for Christ and for his people and actually a victory for the world because at that point all the deception is going to end and the world is going to begin to see the truth and live by the truth and rejoice in that truth because you know people who are deceived it's not because they want to be deceived or that they're evil necessarily it's because they just don't know the truth and once they did or do know they could be very, very fine people of God. They just need to understand and know the truth in order to do something about it. But let's just have a look at what happens at Christ's return. Revelation 19.11 And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And Revelation 19.20 What's going to happen? When Christ returns, what's going to happen to those two people that we just read about, those great Antichrist people that we just read about in Revelation 13? Revelation 19.20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. 
These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So those two evil people are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And Christ will have returned. The first resurrection, as we've covered in other sermons, will then happen at that moment. They will descend with him and begin at that moment the transformation of earth in which there's going to be no more Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist is going to be annihilated. It's going to be erased. It's going to be stopped. Satan is going to be put away. The world is going to finish learning about the truth. I refer you to an earlier sermon uh, done about the second, the coming second half of Christ's ministry in which the world is going to learn the truth and become a wonderful place in which all the nonsense and all the deception and all this antichrist this falling away isn't going to happen anymore people are going to know the truth and having the opportunity by their own free choice to make Christ's offer of salvation happen for them as we have seen happen or happening as we're in the process of happening for the saints today Thank you for joining us for services this week. As always, your being with us makes our joy complete. Until next week, when we meet again on this God's holy Sabbath day, may the Lord bless thee and keep thee. May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.